Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to Thee to come again tonight and to call Thee Father and ask that if we have did anything through this day or any time in our life that's against us in glory, may the blood of Thy dear Son, the Lord Jesus, atone for it just now as we confess our wrongs and ask His forgiveness. We pray that the great Holy Spirit will come tonight, take into the meeting, get into every heart. Get glory out of the service. Save the lost. Call back to the fold the strange sheep. And heal the sick. For we ask it in his name. Amen. And be seated. Good evening, friends. It's so happy to be here again tonight to minister in the name of the Lord Jesus. Just coming in a few moments ago, I was so thrilled to find that Brother Moore had arrived. We're so glad to have him and hear that Brother Brown and Brother Lyle is with them also. A fine man from down Threeport Way and some very fine people down in Louisiana. I know you'd always be welcome down there. And then a little fella met me taking a picture right there as they come in and he shook my hand and said, Brother Branham, I forget several years ago, my mother was laying dying with TB. He said, you prayed for her, said she's been well ever since. So, just, so uh, I just get off of a plane and somebody say, hello, Brother Branham, T- seven or eight years ago, my dad had cancer, he's healed, and this, that, and the other, just, I wonder what it'll be when it's all over and we sit down under the evergreen tree at the throne of God, hear those testimonies, tell the story, how we overcome. We'll understand it better by and by, says the song. Now, maybe tonight, if the Lord willing, I've been promising you a night that we would just simply pray for the sick. Just uh, usually our meetings is, is by divine order of the meeting, uh, by divine gift of knowledge, or whatever you want to call it. And I have thought here a few days ago that The Holy Spirit spoke to me while I was out in the woods and was in prayer. He said, you yet haven't done what I told you to. Pray for the sick. And so uh, maybe tonight we may do that. I told my boy today to give out no prayer cards tonight. We just simply pray for the sick anyhow. If the Lord would provide. We don't know what he's going to do. That's the wonderful thing. We're setting under expectations. We just don't know what he'll do. And now... Tomorrow night, and then just, you know, this, the week just gets away, doesn't it? I think this is Wednesday night. So now, we're going to read just a short portion of God's Word, and then go right straight into the little amateur service of this part, and concentrate mostly on prayer for the sick. So we won't keep you late last evening. We got all under the influence of the Holy Spirit, and I believe... It. We were here till about quarter after ten. I, it's a wonder, the amazing grace that people come back at all, <laughs> and especially a rainy night like this. But you're very lovely, and we appreciate you very much. So bear with us a few moments, if you will, while we read God's Word and talk about Jesus just for a little while. That's the reason we're here, to exalt Him. And that's our motives, is that you love Him and worship Him. And we meet together to worship in that way. Now, in the book of Exodus, I wish to read just a portion of Scripture while I speak maybe the next night or two on this marvelous book. 
And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. I always like to read his word because what I say might be wrong and it might fail, but if I read just a verse out of here, I know that the people hasn't come in vain because uh, that's God's word and it will never fail. It's always be right. Times may change and people may change, uh, but God's word will never change. It's just as changeless as eternity is. Now, this book of Exodus is one of my favorite books of the Old Testament. The very word Exodus, Exodus means called out. And otherwise, it means the church itself, Exodus. They were called the people of God while they were down in Egypt. And then when they were called out, they were then the church of God because church means called out, separated. That's the way you, you know when you're in the true church, when you've been called out by God, separated from the things of the world, and love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul and mind, then you know you're in the church. Now, they might have different dog tags they put on you, like Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, but that's just the dog tag, you see. But after all, I didn't mean it that way. Now, I didn't think about that. I... I meant the brand that you're wearing, see, yeah. otherwise. Um, that's, uh, they have a name, of, you belong to the Methodist Church, but really there's only one church, and that's the church of those who are born again. And that's the only church, you're, you never join God's church, there's no way of doing it at all. And you're born in God's church. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot understand the kingdom of heaven. There's no way of understanding it until you are born again, and then God reveals himself to you, and then you know that you've passed from death unto life, because no man can call Jesus the Christ only by the Holy Spirit. See, the only way that you'll ever know that Jesus is the Christ is when the Holy Spirit personally witnesses to you that he is the resurrected Lord Jesus. No matter what he would do, what kind of signs, what kind of miracles, you'll never know it until your personal experience with God. You say, well, I believe it because the Bible said so. Well, that's good. The Bible, it's true. It knows it. Well, the preacher said so. Perhaps he knows it. Mother said so. She knows it. But what do you know about it? You'll never know it until it's revealed to you individually by the Holy Spirit. And then by accepting it, you become a new creature in Christ Jesus, born the second time. Now, you can't live in, and uh, twice. You have to die once in order to be born again. So when you die out to yourself and are born anew of the Holy Spirit, there's no more reasoning the Word of God. You, don't, you just take it for what it says, and that settles it. That God said it, and that proves it. So this marvelous book was something uh, like the day. I believe the church itself is in a great exodus today. Do you believe that? Yes. A great time of separation. God calling his people. He promised he would do it in the last days. He would separate them, segregate his people. I was speaking not long ago somewhere about where the prophet said, it'll be light in the evening. There would be no a middle time of light, there would be this light in the morning, and then there's light in the evening, and there was a day where it wasn't neither night nor day, just kind of a misty, hazy, something like today. And that's about the way we've lived. And the, geographically, and if you'll notice, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Civilization has rose in the east and always moved westward. And now at the rising of the church in the east was on the day of Pentecost to the eastern people. And now as it's traveled westward across the nations, as the gospel has been brought, it hasn't been exactly, we've said, shine the light, but we've just had the reaction of what light that was taught in the days of the Bible. 
But we really haven't had the light as they had it back there. But God has promised that in the evening it shall be light. We've had enough light to know that Jesus was the Son of God. We've had enough light to know that we ought to live right. But the light of the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus in his signs and wonders and miracles, as he always has in every age, any time when God made himself manifest, there was always signs and wonders. So the very same light that shined on the Eastern people in A.D. 33 is shining on the Western people in 19 and 55 and 6, showing the same Holy Spirit, the same results, the same power, the same Jesus, the same peoples, same kinds of peoples that it was then. So it's light in the evening time. The Exodus, God calling out his people. Making a difference, putting a difference between his people. Now, we want to speak this week a lot on redemption, whether our healing was included in God's plan of redemption. Now, if we can prove that by the scripture, it should settle it. Now, the book of Exodus is a complete book of redemption, redeemed. Redeem means to be brought back, to put in its right position. To redeem anything is something that's went out or it's out of its natural place, its real place. And to redeem it is to bring it back to its place. Man are in this earth to be sons and daughters of God. And when they've wandered out in sin, they're out of their original conditions. And the Holy Spirit, through the blood of Jesus, redeems them back in their right position to be sons and daughters of God. Amen. That's redemption brought back. A man said one time, said, Brother Branham, to redeem, it says, the devil put me in the pawn shop. And the Lord Jesus redeemed me. I thought that was pretty cute and right, too, that the devil puts you in the pawn shop, but Jesus come by and redeems you. And there's always a ransom to be paid when anything is redeemed. And Jesus was our ransom. God sent him and made him in the likeness of sinful flesh, yet he was Emmanuel. A creative blood dwelt within him, and he gave his blood for the redemption prize to redeem us back into reconciliation to God that we might walk with him as in the beginning. When man, in the beginning, when he didn't have to shift for himself, God provided everything he had need of. But after he got reckless and shiftless and, and done wrong and sin separated him from God, then he had to shift for himself. And now Jesus came to redeem this man back into the care of the hands of a loving father. Redemption brought back, replaced, put in position. And how what a wonderful thought tonight it is to know that we in the day that we're living when seemingly that the foundation of every natural thing is falling, that we have this sure rock of salvation, that we've been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a, what a joy that gives the heart of the man who has been partakers of these eternal blessings that God has shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. What a picture, what a, what a loving comfort it is. I tell you, my brethren and sisters tonight, if I had the world packed out with all the money, by the way, someone sent me a letter, a million dollar check, and I got it today, a million dollar check on the bank of heaven. <laughs> Cash is in a hall. All right. If it would just had Jesus' name signed on the bottom of it, I, I'd sure have felt real good about it. <laughs> yes, and to think that dear person just saying that, oh, very fine personal little letter in it. But just remember that 
I have received that check in reality, and everyone here has received the same. I'm not afraid to cash that check. Amen. Christ signed it, and it's good for anything we have need of in all our journey from here to glory. God has freely given it to all of us. The only requirement is, is don't be afraid to cash it. Now, in order in redeeming sickness, we'll have to apply sickness as a result of sin. Now, sin, sickness is not sometimes your sin direct, but the sickness that you have is indirect, maybe. You inherited it from sick sins of your parents or your forefathers. Each generation gets weaker and wiser because we inherit the the differences and the sickness and diseases of the body as it keeps handing down from generation. One man, one time man was made and he lived almost a thousand years. Next time he come down, he'll shorten his days, keep shortening his days and on down to an average life now is around about 40, 45 years old, I suppose. See, we keep getting weaker all the time, but wiser all the time, just to fulfill what God's word said. Now, my brethren here tonight who doesn't preach divine healing as uh, the cure, God's cure for sickness, I wonder how you could apply salvation without uh, applying divine healing. Remember, before we ever had any sickness, we never had any sin. But sin came as a result, uh, or sickness came as a result of sin. Pardon me. Now, then sickness is an attribute of sin. It's what sin produced was the attribute. Like the tree, it bears the apple. It's the attribute of the tree. Now, if sickness is and some people try to separate it, all the attributes of sin, gloominess, weary, temper, malice, envy, strife, they didn't have to make a separate atonement for each one of those things. The one atonement taking care of all of it. For instance, as I've often said, if there was a big uh, animal here on the platform, a big bear or lion, he had his claw in my side and was tearing my side out, it wouldn't be necessary for me to try to find some kind of a knife that could cut his claw off. If I just knocked the thing in the head, it would kill the claw and all. It would take care of the whole thing as long as I killed the animal, kill its head. Well, the head of every one of the attributes of sin is Sin, and when Jesus come dealing with sin at Calvary, he killed sin and he killed every attribute that goes with it. Amen. And completely redeemed us back to God. And today we are sons and daughters of God, perfectly redeemed by a perfect Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, that makes me glad to think about that. Now, we have not got it in full, that's true, but we have the, um, the earnest of our salvation. We have the earnest. If there is, now we are not a past temptation, no, neither are we above sin. But Jesus will help us in every temptation. And now when I do wrong, I'm ready to repent. Anyone else is that wants to live right with God. You don't desire to do wrong, but when Satan upsets you somewhere because there is an atonement waiting for me. If I confess my wrong, God's just to forgive it. And the same thing is when you have got sick. No sign you're immune from sickness. But in every time, God is willing to deliver you from that sickness. See, every time that you get sick, you go to God and ask Him. And then He's willing to deliver you. Because there is an atonement. It's based upon your faith in that atonement. Which is your redemption. And if we know... That this joy that we have, just being the earnest money on what lays ahead, what will it be when we draw the full benefit of the policy? What will it be? My, some people say how people scream and cry and act when the, the Holy Spirit gets on them. I wonder really what it will be when we get to glory. What kind of a, no wonder that it was. They said they sang the songs with palms in their hands, Hosanna, glory to him, and sets up on the throne, Hosanna, singing and waving palms. That'll be a marvelous time. And if just the attributes makes me feel like I do sometimes, what will it be? I'll have to have a different body to stand it. 
But it's the one sure thing. Lord, I know a temptation comes up and I flee to him, my refuge. And then God delivers me from that temptation and sets me free. My heart rejoices and the glory bells ring. I look back and think, oh God, how did you do it? How happy I am. You know, if you, when you're really badly tempted on something, if you'll just make Jesus your refuge and shut your eyes and pass right by it, it'll be the sweetest experience that you've ever went through. Samson, one time when a lion ran out to kill him, he killed the lion, and when the Holy Ghost come up on him, well, he killed, slew the lion as he would a little kid or animal. So when one day passing by, a, a lion's carcass land of the old frame, and some bees had built a honeycombs in there, and he eat it, and he said it was the sweetest honey he ever eat. The very thing that was going to kill him. And when he passed by and seen the old carcass, he enjoyed the honey off of it. So is it now. Amen. When I can see that old life that I once loved, and now it's dead as all midnight, I tell you, I can raise my hands and praise the Lord and eat the sweetest honey I ever eaten all my life. Just joy unspeakable and full of glory. When I can go by and look down there upon and see like that young fellow a while ago, many others, saying, Brother Branham, my mother was dying with TB. This one is in a wheelchair. This little fellow was this way and that way. And now you ask the Lord Jesus and he made them well. I'm telling you, it just makes your heart lift way up. What will it be if that's just the, is just the earnest, what will it be when we really have full redemption? Won't it be wonderful? Oh my, how that great time, the joy it'll be. Then, if I am promised the resurrection of this old mortal pest house that I live in here, if I have been promised a redemption, a brand new body, it'll never be old, it'll never be withered down, but what I've got to have some kind of an earnest of that out of the atonement to prove to me that I'm going to have it. And that is when you see a man laying ridden on the bed with cancer, and our beloved doctors have said, it's done a past the stage of our help, and kneel down and ask the dear Lord Jesus according to his word and his atonement and promise to do it, and see that man raised up to a healthy, stout, red-faced man. I'm telling you, it's the sweetest honey you ever eat. That's right certainly is. And we're sure of it. God has said so. The redemption, the book of redemption to be redeemed. Now this book of Exodus is based upon three heads that we wish to talk about just for a little while, maybe one of them tonight, perhaps two, and then tomorrow night catch up with another. It's based upon the power of Satan and the power of faith and the power of God. Now we read here in the beginning after leaving Genesis, the beautiful book of Genesis, we come into the teaching of Exodus, the called out, separated. We find Satan right quickly at work with God's program. We see that malignant eye of the devil, that serpent that's always tried to interfere with God's program before it comes on earth. And he always knows when it's coming, mostly. Look at him. As soon as we find the first chapter almost in, in Exodus, the book of redemption, we find the devil there to cut off the very program of God. The first thing was an issue made by Pharaoh that they would throw all the children, male children, born of the Hebrews in the river and drown them. Think of it, that same lizard-eyed devil howled back there in the beginning. Look at Abel. As soon as Satan seen that through that righteous seed through Abel was going to come out of the Redeemer quickly, he went to work to destroy the very thing, the very chosen tool that God was going to use. He went right straight to, de to destroy it. Look at it in the time of Joseph, when God was making manifest the Son of God, Jesus Christ, through Joseph. Look how Satan come about to 
about the 27th chapter of, of Genesis there, how that Satan come to destroy Joseph and would have done it. See, the very tool that God was going to use over in Chronicles, about the 22nd chapter, the royal seed, how he tried to destroy that. And on over in, in Matthew 2, look how quickly that Satan was on the job. When he knew it was about the time for the Redeemer to be born, he got into the political leaders and sent forth an issue and destroyed all the young children from two years old down in order to kill the Lord Jesus. How he tried to do it and succeeded in Matthew 27. He succeeded in doing it. But here's what I like. Satan can only, his dominion only reigns down to the river. River means death, separation. That's all the farther Satan's dominion can come. It stops. But then God begins. What the beautiful hope tonight to know that every person, every one of the believers, when they stand by the grave weeping over their children, over their loved ones, faith can stand right in the midst of it and look beyond them shadow genre to a God of resurrection from the dead. Oh, what a picture this beautiful book lays out to us here in parables. How that God teaching us by those things back there what He was going to do and confirmed every word of it in Christ Jesus our Lord, the perfect Redeemer. How that going to the river, they take the little ones and threw them in the river. And then notice, that's the end of Satan's dominion. His domain can only come that far to the river and then his powers is cut off. It is that Satan has the power of death, but thanks be to the living God who has the power of resurrection beyond the shadows of death. What a marvelous thing it is. I want you to look at it. Study it for a minute. Every one of us under the domain of Satan here in this world, which is his, he walked in the fiery brimstones before there was a creature on it. It belongs to him. He's a ruler of the night in every government and every politic. He's a ruler. That's why we have wars and rumors of wars and troubles. But oh, think then some glorious day. Oh, when Satan took Jesus up on the top of the mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, that's all it was or would be. Said, oh, they're all mine. I'll do with them whatever I want to. And I'll give them to you if you'll fall down and worship me. Jesus knew that he was going to fall heir to those things anyhow in the millennium. So he said, get behind me, Satan. It's written, thou shalt worship the Lord and him only shall you serve. And when we see Satan and all of his corruption of making young ladies and man and old and everything out there on the street, drunk, cursing, swearing, acting the way they're doing under Satan's domain, but we can look beyond that with eyes of faith and can see a perfect world with a perfect people during the time of the millennium where there won't be any cursing, any swearing, any drinking, any death, any sorrow. It'll all be wiped away because of the Redeemer. Now, it's your faith comes in the next power now from Satan's power and he ends at the river. Thank God for that. He, God has a power beyond anything that any era of death could ever touch. God is the resurrection. There. Now Satan cast the end at the river. The river means death. The little ones was cast into the river. And that settled it. They were gone. Crocodiles, gators and everything in there chewed them up. That was the end of it. Drowned in the river. Eat up by the... By the beast of the river. Now, when Moses was born, Moses, God's instrument, chosen, provided, for ordained, elected, predestined by God for his to be his tool to work with in that age. Satan was doing everything he could to catch him, but God pulled it over on him. Why? 
We find out here that a daughter of Levi, or son of Levi, went and married a daughter of Levi, and this children child was born, and when it was born, they seen that it was the right kind of a child. Amen. I hope you get this. She looked at that baby, and there was something taking place. She knew that the time was nigh that they should be delivered, and the Holy Spirit, to my opinion, revealed to her, this is him. And she wasn't afraid of the king's commandment and his threats. There you are. When faith takes a hold, fear drops away. Faith's got big muscles and a hairy chest. When it speaks, everything else keeps quiet. <laughs> Cancer has to shut up and get out of the way. Tumor, TB, the rest of it moves out. When faith raises up, says, sit down. That settles it. <laughs> oh, my. Let it be King Pharaoh or ever who it was. When that little old housewoman raised up and looked at that child, she wasn't afraid what the king said. That's the second power we're going to talk on. The power of the devil, sure, he has the power and reign of death. But the second power was given was faith. And faith puts Satan to shame. Certainly it does. That little housewife held that little baby in her arms, and she wasn't afraid of the king's commandments. She didn't care what the king said. She knew God was able, and God would keep his word. Oh, if we could only accumulate that kind of faith tonight, get that kind of faith living among us, Maybe moving in our beings, moving through the church. Not just the emotional faith, but a real solid faith that won't take no for an answer. Know that God said so and that settles it. I love it. Look at it now. What did she do? She didn't try to have her baby to escape the death penalty that was passed upon all the children, but by faith. She made an ark and slimed it within and without and put pitch in it for an atonement to carry him through the waters of death. What a beautiful picture of Christ. Never shunning or not my will but thine be done. Not shunning death but willing to take death in order to make an atonement for us to ride over the river of death on. What a beautiful picture here we have. Look at the mother weaving these little bulrushes together and taking some slime and putting all on the inside of it so it'll be nice and soft and pitch on the outside. Now, over in Leviticus, if you'll read, you'll find out that word pitch and slime is also translated atonement. Read it and find out if that isn't true. It's an atonement. It was also made uh, called atonement in the days of Noah. When Noah, 120 years of preaching, yet saved no souls but his own household, and was warned of God and knew that judgment was coming, and he knew he could not escape it, but God provided an atonement for him. I love that. God will make a way. Let that soak real deep. No matter what the trouble is, God will make a way. He's called in the Bible Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will provide. Yes. Amen. Yes. I'm so glad tonight to know that he's still Jehovah Jireh. No matter what the circumstances is, God will make a way. Make a way of escape. The Satan may pin you in a corner with a cancer. God will make a way of escape. Satan may pin you down under a car. God will make a way of escape. Satan may take your family away from you, but God will make a way of escape. God has a way. Notice. And now, Noah, let's look at that ark just a moment, how he provided it. Now, he just couldn't go out and cut down any kind of a tree. Because any kind of thing won't stand the judgments of God. The water was divine judgment that was going to destroy all the world. And it had to be something that would face the divine judgment. And friend of mine, I want you to know tonight, 
that there is coming a divine judgment on all the world. Remember, Satan's having his domain now. You think you're having a big time. But wait! His dominion will end pretty soon. Then the kingdom of God will be established. I want to be in that kingdom. Standing persecutions in present daytime now, looking forward to the coming of the great king on whose kingdom and dominion I am trying to uphold before the people to say that he's not dead like other gods are supposed to be, but he is risen from the dead and is alive forevermore. Look at him. Oh, I love this. That makes me feel real religious when I think of that. <laughs> to think of it. Now, God specified the kind of wood that Noah was to build that ark out of. And it was called gopher wood. One day I happened to look up and thought, well, what kind of a wood would that be? So I began to look back into the word, uh, dictionaries and so forth to find out what gopher wood meant. And then I, I got to find out what it was. And it was a real soft wood. Real soft and tender wood. Well, I thought, say, where could that apply to the believer? The ark is built. As the church, the ark was the church. And I said, oh, I see it, God. It's built out of believers. Not cold and indifferent, hard, but soft and applicable to the hands of God. That's what the ark was built out of. Oh, I said, praise the Lord. <laughs> That's good. Tender-hearted. Willing to admit you're wrong. Say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Then God can take that and move and place it in the ark. Then Satan come along and said, but you better read a little more and find out what that was. The wood had, soft wood, has open pores. And there's, it's just real soft. And that kind of a gopher wood, if you'd put it in the water, in a few minutes, it would be waterlogged, the ship would. If you made an ark out of gopher wood and pitched it out there in the water... It's so open, the pores so open, making the wood soft till the waters would soak right into it and the ship would sink just in a little bit. But I noticed then that God told Noah to pitch this ark, put pitch in it, on the inside and on the outside, both sides. Well, then I seen what pitch was made out of. It was a pine tree, hard tree, that was cut down an evergreen tree, ever alive tree. <laughs> And it was cut down and they beat the tree with a beaten iron until they beat the rosin out of it. And then they put the rosin in a pot and boiled it until it got real, real hot. And this hot rosin was poured up on this gopher wood and it opened, just soaked it in. And when it became full of this rosin, then when it, once full of that rosin, it settled and set up. It was harder than steel. Now I thought, that's it, Lord. Get a good open-hearted person and pour in the pitch, which was the Holy Ghost, into the believer with the Holy Ghost and fire until they're so soaked full they're not their self anymore. <laughs> then she can blunt the waves, bump against the logs and knock them out of the way and keep going on. Hallelujah. The only thing that can stand the judgments today is a born-again Christian filled with the Holy Ghost. God hit the Spirit of God and poured it out upon him and soaked his whole being full. Amen. I like that. Then he begins to can really shove out into the devil's territory without looking right or left. Amen. That's what the believer is. He's actually poured, he's soft-hearted, and God just pours in full of divine love that he can brace the divine judgments of sin of God. And it carried Noah through. How I like to see this little mother with her little ark there all pitched inside and outside. Slime and pitch on it. And now she comes down to the river. She's, she's not willing, she's not ready to make her little boy have to hide him out somewhere. But by eyes of faith she's seen what God was going to do. She took him right down to the river and this little ark... 
And no doubt, we couldn't think that was a natural act, friend. It's got to be a supernatural act. There she was standing there with the crystal tears in her eyes as she placed her little baby as it was in the casket of death that was going to pitch it out on the water there. And of course she knew that by faith she believed that behind all the clouds of darkness there was a living God who would take that baby to its destination for she seen it was a proper child. Amen. That's the way I think tonight about the little old Holy Ghost Church. It may be kicked around this way or that way, called everything. But I know that God has poured the pitch into that church and someday, I don't know how. I can't tell you. But God will take it to its eternal destination. I don't know how. Because I sit moving by the Holy Spirit, it's all supernatural to me. I don't understand it. I just believe it and accept it. Move on with it as the tides move on. How she pitched this little ark and set it out on the ocean. Remember, in that ocean was crocodiles and everything. But not one bit of fear was in the mother's heart. For she was, when she placed that baby in there, she was walking in the same footsteps of her father Abraham years ago, who walked by faith and called those things which were not as though they were. For he endured seeing him who is invisible. And the same is tonight with any man or any woman who is the children of Abraham. By faith you pitch out not knowing you can't show by any supernatural or any sign rather what it is, but you believe it because God has said so and you take him at his word. Amen. Watch him now as it goes on. My, these nights are just not long enough. Notice, just when you get to a point, you have to stop. <laughs> just go just a little farther. Let's follow this baby for a few moments. There she puts him out into the ocean with faith leaving. You know, sometimes when we come to our loved ones right down to the very bitter tears of laying them away and so forth, like she was there in a tight putting him in the sea or in the Nile... The waters of death, while the gloomy clouds was all around her, eyes could look through that and know that behind that cloud was the living God of the resurrection. She couldn't see it with her eyes, but faith was standing there with her. That man with strong muscles and a hairy chest could look beyond the cloud yonder and see God behind the cloud. And tonight, maybe a cancer has conquered you. Maybe something else has taken a hold of you, some disease. Even the disease of sin or whatever it is. It may look dark and gloomy to you now. May it look like you'll never recover. Maybe it look like you can't get over that TB, or that prostate trouble, or that lung trouble, whatever it is, that tumor, that crippled condition. The doctor may say ever hope is gone. But standing right by your side tonight, ready to take you in possession, stands the eyes of faith who sees the victory out of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Away with Satan in his gloom and up with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The faith of Almighty God. Faith can take its holy stand on the rock of ages and pierce the eagle eye through every stormy cloud when the very waves of death and disappointment is trying to wash its foundation out from under it. It can stand there and look beyond the skies and say, God is right. And believe the counsel of the wise and living God. Amen. What faith will do. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. The very faith that the little wit that you have standing by you. If you'll only let it take you into possession tonight. And take you and believe and have faith in it. And believe that God's word is true and you've accepted it. Then faith will work miracles for you. Do you believe that? God's word has said this which is the infallible word. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils or evil spirits. And speak with new tongues or take serpents or drink deadly things that wouldn't harm them. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. God's word says that. There's something trying to work in every individual heart here tonight saying that's the truth. But does it mean me? Yes, it means whosoever will let him come. It means you. 
The Holy Ghost is here to save every sinner, to call back every backslider, to heal every sick person. That's the attributes of the death of Jesus Christ. And he's sure to make manifest. Night after night you see him. Hour after hour you see him working. And right now while I'm trying to keep away from that anointing of the blessed Holy Spirit, which the angel of God, who's the infallible person in our midst tonight, I'm having a time because visions are jumping all over the building at this time. And trying to keep it down so I can have this prayer line. I'm not a liar and neither am I a hypocrite. I'm telling you the truth. That's right. Because why? The Holy Spirit likes for you to have faith. And the Holy Spirit lives on the Word. That's the reason it gets big in you. It stretches out. When you receive the Word of God, man, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And when you put the Holy Ghost in you and go to drink it in the Word, you begin to rise up in faith. Hallelujah. No, you think I'm crazy. That's all right. I feel better crazy than it did the other way. So I just stayed this way. Amen. If it takes a crazy person to believe the Word of God, let me stay the way I am then. If I'm supposed to be crazy and believe this. I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, raised from the dead, standing right here in this building tonight. I believe He's omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. Hallelujah. Has all wisdom, all places, fills all space, and all powerful. He's the true and the living one. You believe that? That's the way to believe and to be saved. That's the only way you can be saved, is to believe in Him. He's here. He's the one who looked over his audience. How many here's got if people that wants to be prayed for tonight? Raise up your hand. I want you to be prayed for. I've tried a long time to get you to believe it. I've roamed back and forth across this United States for the ministry that has been tested in every fire the devil could put onto it and run out a hundred percent true, and it always will. Or it's not me, it's not mine, it's his. And I know he can take care of his own. Moses, Abraham, believed God. When he told him he was going to have the child, when he's even a hundred years old, he still believed God. For he knew he was able to take care of what he had promised. God still tonight. When Jesus Christ said, these things that I do shall you also even more, for I go to my Father. He was able to do it. Not only was he able, but he would do it, and he has done it. And he always will do it, because he's God and can't fail. It's our little weakness of our own human intellectual, what we call intellectual faith. We read a little something and say, yeah, that's, I believe that's right, that's intellectual. Brother, something's got to happen down here to make you really believe it. Your intellectual faith will reason and say, now let's see. But my case is so hard, there's no need to be trying to do it. My case is too hard. That's your reasoning. What's too hard for God? A long time ago when I got saved, about 23 years ago, I made up in my mind right like this. I wasn't going to worry about anything God said because God's able to keep his own word. And anything that's any job that's too big for God to do, what's the use of me worrying about it? <laughs> Amen. If he's the Almighty God, he does all things. If he can't do all things, he's not Almighty God. So I believe him to be Almighty God. So I commit myself to him, my soul to him, my body to him, my living to him, my breathing to him, my dying to him, my resurrection to him. And some glorious day, he'll come. But while he's in the coming in his churches in the making, I want to stand in the breach with my arms out and claim his resurrected power, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his power has never ceased and never will fail. He's the same all the way around. Amen. I love him. And I want you to love him. I want you to believe him. Perfect love casts out all fear. If you love him with the right kind of heart, you won't have one speck of fear whether you keep his word or not. Night after night, standing on the platform before the gross thousands of people around the world, critics sitting there saying, it's this, that, and the other witch doctors sitting there trying to throw spells on you, challenge you to duels and things like that. Never one time I say by the grace of God has one speck of fear ever hit my heart. Not one time. Why? 
He said he would take care of me, and I believe him. That's why. If I'd get scared, I'd run. But I tell you, when Jesus Christ anoints you, you're not made out of running material. That's all. Not the rock of Gibraltar, but the rock of ages. You climb up on the rock of ages, that's God's word, and take your position there and stand while the gates of hell are battling against it with this perfect assurance that he who promised it not fail will never fail. Amen. That's faith. That's when you're not scared. The devil's nothing but a bluff anyhow. Snorting and blowing all thunder and no lightning. But I tell you, brother, the lightning power of the resurrected Jesus Christ puts a reality there that shocks the soul from a dead slumber of these earthly bound things into the immortal rims to believe God and take Him at His word and call those things which are not as though they were. Amen. Amen. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Called out, set aside. A church bought and washed and ironed out without spot or wrinkle. That's what He's coming for. God, help us to get our faith in the right place tonight. Move out on the battleground there and say, Satan, you're a liar. Jesus Christ died to make me free and it's mine. Get out of here. You went to your home tonight, you legitimate people, and there's a bunch of drunks in there kicking around, carrying around, smoking, drinking, cursing, and living in Marley. You'd say, hey, get out of here. This is my house. You'd say, I'm a human being. It's built for human beings. They're all right here. You say, this is my house. I have an abstract deed that proves this is my property. Then if you show him the deed and he will not move, then there's a law down here that will make him move. And if that devil had come to you tonight, try to send you to a premature grave, try to cripple you up, read God's abstract deed by his stripes. We were healed. And if you don't want to believe that, there's the Holy Ghost here, the law of God. Kick him out. That'll prove it. Just ring up Jesus. Central, J-E-S-U-S. Find out if something don't take place. The angels of God will take their positions and that devil will get out. You can stand there on your toes and say, yes, sir, it's the truth. Amen. Not up here, down here. You read your title clear. You know what it is. Call oh, my. Feel like taking them wings sometimes and fly away, don't you, when you think of that? Lift me up above the shadows, give me fellowship divine. Yes, sir. Stand up in there where all things are possible. Stand up there where Enoch did. My, when he took a little stroll one afternoon with God and walked on home with him, just didn't want to come back. Hallelujah! Not one morning, one evening. Amen. The rapture, the resurrection. He had a testimony he pleased God because he believed God. Amen. That's what we need. That's what we want. That's what we have. But you're afraid to use it. Amen. What good someone give my boy when after this meeting's over, if God willing, we take her vacation, go up in the mountains to hunt. What good did it do that man to give him a gun if he isn't going to use it? It's sitting there, it's a fine gun, but it'll never do no good unless he used it. That's where your faith is. Oh, it's a fine faith. You read, you believe, you have an experience of God, you believe. Yeah, but what good faith without works is dead? Put it to work. Don't be slowful. Get it going. My, I, I just see things happening out in the audience. <laughs> I'm trying to get away from it so he gets the prayer line started. Uh, but I can't. It just keeps moving on. Hallelujah. No need to grieve in the Holy Spirit about things. That's right. Let's believe Him. You believe Him with all your heart. You people sitting there tonight in your audience, this is a powerful anointing. When I come here tonight, try to pray for the sick without cards, without praying, just bring them up and let them come through and pray for them. God has poured out, seemed like a double potion upon me. And I just can't keep from, I can't call a prayer line. It's just moving everywhere. I challenge your faith in the resurrected Lord Jesus. That's right. You only believe. Lady, you got your hand up there. Do you believe with all your heart? You believe me to be his servant? Jesus Christ will let me know what's wrong with you standing here. Will you accept your healing? You will? Will the rest of you do it? Believe it, he raised me and I've represented right? What is this? This is faith. 
What was it? He said, I'll be with you. I believe him. That's right. If you believe it, that rupture you have in your navel will be, be cured up tonight. That's what you have, isn't it? You just wave your hand. All right? You believe it, you can have what you ask for. Hallelujah. Believe God. All things are possible. Have faith in God. Oh, isn't he wonderful? Jesus said, I can if you believe. First, you've got to believe. Sitting out there on the end of the row looking this way. Your hand up, sir. Out on that first little row looking this way. Bother with sinus trouble. Do you believe that God would make you well? Right there. The person sitting right next to you there. You believe, do you? If you do, raise up, lady. That's right. You believe? God bless you. And receive your healing. Amen. That's it. Sitting right back over here, the lady sitting right back over there with her hands crossed like this. You got trouble with your back, haven't you, lady? And don't know what it is. Isn't that true? Sitting around the end of the bench back there. Raise up if that's true. Way back there. To, that's right. God bless you. There's the angel of God standing right by the woman. You got something wrong with your back and you just don't know what it is. Isn't that right? If that's right, raise your hand. I can tell you one thing. It's gone from you now. You don't feel it now. If that's right, raise your hand back and forth. There it is. It's all gone. See, turn light around the woman. Praise the Lord. Faith, believe it. God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. Lady, you just so blessed just then. There's a lady sitting right next to you there that has a nervous trouble. She's got her hands up. Raise up, lady, just a minute. Sitting right there next to you. All right, now you can go home too. Your nervousness is done. Jesus Christ made you well. Your faith heals you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What do you think up there in the balcony up there tonight? You're believing with all your heart. Have faith. Oh, hallelujah. You might call me a holy old professor. Your days are mine too. That doesn't make any difference. I know who I believe. I know what I believe. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The exodus for the church. The Redeemer for all ages. His presence showing the same thing that he showed when he was here on earth. Glory to God. You believe him? If you have faith, you can have anything you want. If you haven't got faith, you can't receive nothing. What about you, sir, sitting over in that chair? Wheelchair, cot, whatever it is. You believe Jesus Christ died for you? I don't know. You've never seen it. You got a prayer card? You haven't? You believe me to be his prophet? Will he accept the same thing? You're sitting over TV, aren't you, sir? That's right. You come from out of town, didn't you? Come down to Illinois around Bloomington, didn't you? That's right. There sits another lady right behind you, sitting back there. She's got a fallen kidney. Sitting right, she's from the same town. She comes from the same place. A fallen kidney got infection in her eye. That's right. Sitting right back there on the end of the seat. Kind of a gray-headed lady with glasses on. I see you all too, for coming from the same town called Bloomington. That's right, lady. Raise up your feet back there with the glasses on. You're from Bloomington, too. You ain't got no prayer card, have you? Don't have no prayer card. All right, you believe me to be God's servant? All right, sir, get up out of the wheelchair and you get up, says, and go on back home and get well. Hallelujah. Believe God. If you want to accept it, have faith in God. Believe with all your heart. You can have what you ask for. Here's the Holy Ghost stand over a colored woman sitting right down here, sitting right back here. She's got a tumor and she's got eye trouble. She's got her hand up waving at me. That's right, ladies. Stand on your feet. Jesus Christ makes you whole. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you believe? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lives and reigns. He's here. He's your exodus from sickness to health. He's your exodus from the wheelchair to walking again. He's your exodus from the cancer to health. Do you believe it? I challenge you in Jesus Christ's name. Stand on your feet and claim it, and God will give it to you right now if you've got faith enough to believe it. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I condemn every devil and every doubt that there is in here, and may the Holy Ghost move in this building and burst this whole unbelief Amen. away and heal everyone. In peace. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the